and get this party started. So like I said, I'm Steve McGillivray, your host today, uh, Flying Solo. I'm one of two account admins here at Arizona University working for Arizona University, not of entry, even though it doesn't, you can't tell <laughs> sometimes when I talk. The other account admin, Laura Rutherford, is not able to join us today, so it's just me, so who knows what's going to happen. Uh, if you saw the agenda posted on Slack, this is what we're going to cover today, the usual old business, just some reminders uh, about things to keep in mind. We're going to talk about some features in Theme Editor. Uh, again, a lot of these topics come from questions that Laura and I see going over the Slack channel, going over the eventry support queue. Yes, we see those support tickets when you're chatting with support. And this is what gives us ideas for topics for the user group and for support docs on our website. So we're going to talk about theme editor. That's going to be a big topic of conversation, I think, for the next few months. And we're also going to talk about HTML emails in Eventry because we saw some questions there as well. But before I dive into that, some of you may be aware that uh, there was an event yesterday called the Event Vendor Showcase. And Office of University Events and Protocol and Aventry at ASU had a booth set up there. And our friends at Aventry sent us some tchotchkes as giveaways at that booth. And we still have a good amount of materials from them that we would like to give to you. So a special offer today for just for a thank you for joining us here at the user group, exclusive to the user group, the Aventry user group is we are offering you these tchotchkes from Eventry, Eventry branded gear. This includes a nice padded messenger bag, t-shirts in these sizes. It's various colors that we have available. If you're interested in golf balls, we have some golf balls away. And of course the obligatory ballpoint pen. So just as a thank you for joining us today. If you are interested in any of th these items, all you need to do is send an email to eventry at asu.edu and in the body of the email include your name, include your mail code because that's how we're going to get them to you or tell us what you would like. Now I'd we like to restrict it to we'll send it one item per person. But if you would like to give us a, this is my first choice, this is my second choice, just to better your chances of getting something, that's fine. If you do want one of the t-shirts, do include what size t-shirt you would like. And we are simply going to take this in order as the emails arrive until we can clear out all the inventory goods, all the inventory tchotchkes we have in our warehouse. Okay, I will repeat these instructions and show the prices again at the end of the presentation, but I just wanted to offer that to you now, so think about it. And you don't have to jump on that email now. You can wait till the end of the presentation. So here we go. Let's go back to old business. Our usual reminder about the DMARC email security you should be using an eventry in any from or sender email fields in the registration or the marketing module and simply adding the a dot in front of the asu.edu of the domain name again only in the from or the sender you don't have to do it in the reply to email address in fact you shouldn't do it uh, but this is how if you do not have a dmark domain in those fields you're going to get the the very scary looking message about your domains not permitted or something along those lines. Okay, so that's what that's about. This is this DMARC email security that UTO is implementing for all third party email services and they consider Eventry to be a third party email service. Okay. A reminder about the theme editor. The theme editor is going to become the default look and feel software in the registration site. The old legacy look and feel is going to be discontinued. It's just going to stop being useful at the end of June, say July 1st. And what that means is if you have a, an event going on right now, a registration active, 
and it's using the old look and feel and it's going to go, you know, it's going to be active beyond July 1st, you're fine. But the next time you clone it, you will not be given an option to keep the old look and feel. You will have to use the new theme editor. Now, if you'd like to get ahead of the curve, you can. You can turn on the theme editor to any legacy registration site. Uh, it is already activated on uh, the most recent templates we've given you, 4.1.2. So that might be a good excuse to just start from scratch and get a whole, you know, the latest and greatest template. Uh, if you just want to update an existing legacy event, there are how-to articles on our support website, eventry.asu.edu, I'll direct you to. Also happy to set up a time with you to, uh, uh, to have some office hours and help walk you through it. It's not difficult at all. There are just a few kind of things to watch out for when you make the transition from an, a legacy event to the theme editor. Okay, but just to remind you, that is on its way. Okay. And now, since we're talking about theme editor, let's talk about some of the benefits of theme editor. And actually, I think the, the first one I think is actually huge is that for the first time with theme editor now in place, you can do a lot with the images you upload to the Eventry Images database. This is how you can access the Eventry Images database. You can upload your images. Of course, you've known how to do that, or we've shown you how to do that in theme editor, but you can also upload folders so that you can now organize your images. You can edit the images after you've uploaded. You can edit them upon upload, but you can now also edit them, change their size, and by editing, I mean change their size or dimensions after they've been uploaded. You can also move those images around so now you can organize your unit folder of the images in your unit folder. And now you can also delete images. This is all accessible through the theme editor, okay? So let me show you how that's done. This tips and tricks of the theme editor. Specifically, we're going to talk about tips and tricks for handling graphics. The new theme editor uh, provides you access to the images database on the back end. So you can now organize your images in your folders. You can delete old images and you can even resize. And I wanted to show you how to do that in this video. So here I am in the theme editor. I'll close the themes section over on the right. I'm going to open up the header logo. This feature is available through the header logo section. And to get there, you want to click on select image from your database. When I open this window, it's going to show me my unit folder and anything I want to add to the uh, images database for use here or anywhere else in my, in my site can be uploaded here, but you have to be inside your unit folder before you upload, otherwise you won't see it. So here we have my unit folder or my unit folder inside the images database currently looks like I've done some organizing. So a couple of different things you can do. First, there is a way that you can add your own folders for organizing the images database. And to do that, you create a folder somewhere on your desktop, name it the way you like for whatever purpose you like, and then you can simply drag that folder from your desktop to this section. So I'm going into my unit folder and let go. And so now it has added that folder to my images database and I could go into it. There's nothing there now, uh, but the folder is there and I can use that for sorting and organizing my images. If I want to upload images into this folder directly, I would again be inside the folder 
and then uh, drag and drop an image from my database into the folder. So here's my theme editor background. I'm going to drop into this new folder. When I do that, it's going to give me this opportunity to edit now if I have to uh, resize this image for my purposes. This is my chance to do it now by clicking the edit button and I can select change its name, I can select which folder it's going into, uh, and I can also resize and crop the image, and this will replace the image I just uploaded. I don't want to do that. This image is sized just the way I want it, so I'm just going to hit save and exit. And it kicks me back out to the top level of the folder, so I'm going to go back inside my unit folder, I can go back inside my new theme editor backgrounds folder, and there is my upload. Now, you'll also notice I have these two icons next to every listing here. One is to delete an image and the other is to edit. And by editing, I can go back into that image. And again, I could change its name. I can choose a different folder. And again, I can get back to this resize and crop feature. Okay. So just to go through the motions, if you want to get rid of some of these extraneous items, or I just want to organize images, I'm going to go into Edit, and I'm going to find my new Theme Editor Backgrounds folder, and hit Save and Exit. Again, I got, I've been kicked out to the top level again, going back inside. And there is the background image I moved. What about deleting? Should be pretty simple. Just click the trash can. It's going to ask you, are you sure you want this permanent deleted? And it's gone. Okay, so that is how you can edit your images, organize your folder to navigate here. So I'm in my, in my unit folder, top level. If I go into any of these folders, you'll see how I hit the path up here at the top. If I want to go back up a level, I can just click on that upper level name. I can even go back to the very top level if I want to. Right? It's giving you the path here at the top. So that's how you can use this feature in Theme Editor under the header logo section to organize your images in the images database. I just want to pause that for a moment because I see I've got some questions. I had a, I was in full screen before you guys. Are these image folders specific to user? Uh, the you the you have access to your units folder. Uh, you don't share backend folders with members uh, or members outside your team. I mean, if you there are ways to share an event uh, registration with members of your outside team. Uh, if you create it or they create it and they use an image, as long as it's an event tree, you will all be able to see it in that registration or in that email. But uh, no, you cannot share the uh, unit images folder. Okay, so I hope that, hope that answers your question. Actually, see, I've been kicked out of Aventry over here, so let me go back in. Get ready for our next demo. Yeah, the, the, the um, asking about how to uh, edit um, or how to edit images, getting you access to the images database. That's always been a big ask, and at least now it's not ideal, I would say, but it's a way to uh, organize your, your images database. All right, there we go. Oh, all right, I see what I did there. I am still my admin account. Okay, what's next? Right, so I did see this pass over the support tickets, the changing the capitalization of field labels. Uh, although that sounds like a very dry academic paper, what it really means is in our templates, we decided to have all of our field labels in all caps. 
And we've seen requests on, you know, it's your choice. You can customize your events however you like. And we've had the request on how do you change this from all caps to capitalization? And it's a pretty easy method for doing that. Uh, let me see, I've got... So to do that in theme editor, let me just open up here our preview, show you what we're talking about. And this is gonna affect field labels throughout the registration site. So it's what it looks like now. So I'm gonna go into theme editor and I'm actually gonna pick the Tandy info page here, all right? Now all the codes, all the fun stuff or the difficult stuff of theme editor is inside the colors and fonts. And you could search for it this way, although it's a very long list. The, the easy way to find the fields you want to adjust, to hold your mouse over the main, main screen here. And as you hold your mouse over the thing you wanna change, you'll see on the right there a button appears called related variables. And if you click that, Theme Editor pulls up in a new related variable section, all the different variables in this section. And we're looking for capitalization. And you see it's right there, QL, question, label, capitalization. And it's set for uppercase in our templates. I just cloned our templates for this demo. All you gotta do is click on that and you have your choice, uppercase, lowercase, or capitalize. If I change to capitalize, Lovely. And again, anytime I make a change in theme editor and I want to keep it, I want to hit save. Now, if I go back to preview event, hit refresh, here we go. All of my labels now will show upper or lowercase, right? Now you saw the other options. You do could say none. Well, why would you say none? That would just allow whatever you have used for capitalization to appear. So there would be it would be in the system. The HTML CSS would not be affecting the formatting at all with this if you use the none. But if you want to keep a consistency throughout your form, use one of these styles, and uh, you'll be good to go. Okay. What next? Managing HTML emails. Yeah, we saw some questions that came over the Slack channel about different things, different issues, different requests with handling HTML emails. Um, what I will not get into is how to design an HTML email for an email campaign. I could have, oh, there probably are whole workshops on how to do that. And if you're not into HTML or CSS coding, uh, they probably wouldn't interest you even if I wanted to talk about that today. But I do wanna be able to give you the tools to uh, recreate or share some of the HTML emails we have designed for you. So I'm gonna talk about how to transfer different HTML email code within different parts of a ventry. A specific request on how to add buttons uh, to an existing email, I'll show you that. And I'll also just touch on another thing is how you can add HTML email designs that have been created in other email campaign services, other services outside of a ventry. And it's actually the same tricks as the first one, but Again, just for the purpose of this video and demonstrating, I will show you how to do it. Let's go into our event emails. Okay. And usually it's a quest uh, that uh, perhaps you have a legacy event. You don't have uh, any of our templated emails and scheduled emails. You want to create one down there. So I'm going to just recreate one. I'm gonna go into the system email for confirmation. Yeah, it's a pretty, actually, it's a pretty standard design across all of our templated emails. I'm going to go down here to this email. And the trick is to copy the code. If I was just to click inside this box and se select, I would not be selecting the code. I would just sort of be topping the rendered version of the code. 
To copy the code, what you wanna do is go to the source button inside the toolbar, click that, and now you're seeing the HTML code that I designed for this email. And I just want to select all and copy all the code. Now I'm gonna go back out of this. Yes, I'm gonna leave. And down here, I'm going to create my email. I'm gonna assume I didn't have these already formatted. So I'm just gonna go from scratch. And yes, it's a custom email. And then down here, when you create an email with that create email button, it defaults to a Ventry's single column template system, uh, which some people use. I'm just not a big fan of it. For this purpose though, what we want to do is change this to the custom HTML template because we're going to be using our own template. Yes, I wanna make that change. And now we see this familiar field. Again, I hit source code, click in there and paste, hit source again. And now here is my email or the template uh, for whatever purpose I wanna use this template for down in the scheduled email section. If I want to uh, finish this out, otherwise I will get an error message that I cannot save. Oop, that's not what I want to do. That's what I want. That's all I'm going to do right now and just save and exit. Let's try that again. Come here, Ventry. Thank you. All right. All right. So there's my new email, and now I can customize that as much as I want. Now, what if you have an email and an HTML email, and all you want to do is add a button to an existing uh, email. Let me first say that this, that what I'm about to show you will work the best if you are using one of our templated emails. It's gonna have some code someplace that you may need, but let me show you. I know the incomplete registration has a button in it, Yeah, and I have this button. So I wanna copy the code of this button. And this is a scary with HTML and CSS I'm gonna get for you guys right now. I'm gonna go into the source code and I'm gonna search for button in the source code. I'm just using my browser search feature. And here, I this is an HTML comment. This is what a coder puts inside the source code of the HTML to tell another coder coder or themselves, where different sections start and end or what's going on inside. It's kind of leaving your, uh, the designer leaving the notes for themselves to, to use later. And so what I'm gonna do, as you see, I have a start ASU style button and an end ASU style button and comment. I'm gonna copy all this code. And that's the only code I'm gonna copy. Okay, just copied it. Let's go back out to the system. And now I wanna add this button to my email for a survey. I'm gonna give my attendees after the fact. Now here's a trick I do. So here's my email and I want the button to show up right there. Now I need to find this spot inside the HTML code when I hit the source button. So I give myself a little hint, X marks the spot. I can go into the source code. Now I can search for that XXX and there it is, okay? It made a little paragraph style. I can actually highlight this whole line because that's all it is at that X. And now I can paste my button here, right? It's just where I want it to be. I can hit source and there's my button. I can now 
Oops, I can now change. The text, I can change the URL. It's not really where it's gonna go, but yeah. I don't really have a, sor I don't have a survey link, but it could be used for any link. It could be used for the inventory survey. It could be used for Qualtrics or whatever, or SurveyMonkey or whatever URL you have. Right. And that's how I can put an HTML button inside an existing email. Now, if you do want to use this button somewhere else, uh, it might work. I was testing this earlier and the code seemed to work anywhere. If it doesn't, there's some additional code inside of our HTML template here that is calling up a, a style, calling up what's called a class. And it's just telling whatever renders the email, what it's supposed to look like. You may need that. If you do, you know, contact me and I will walk you through what you need. But again, that's getting a little too deeper into HTML than many of my users are comfortable with. <laughs> All right. All right. Now we showed you how to transfer HTML from one section of inventory to another. And this works throughout inventory. If you want to grab one of the marketing emails you've got and put it inside your event registration, you can do it the same way. If you want to go the opposite way, registration to marketing, you can do it the same way. It's just copying the HTML code and pasting it in another email somewhere else in the system. But you can also use this for grabbing emails created by other email services. Well, why would you do that? Well, I've been in the use case where uh, we, we work with a department um, for an event and the students design all the materials, including the email. And we found it easier for them to design their email in MailChimp. Um, that way they are making it in HTML for us. When they are ready, they send us the email design. I'm able to copy the code out of that email and paste it into a entry for our use. Now, here's one, here's an email I've received that I'm able to use. And the trick here is the email that you receive has to have a way to view this email online. That little feature will open up the email in a web browser. And that's key. If you're, if you can't find, you, you've, you've seen it in our email, you know, view this email online or open this up in a web browser, anything like that, it opens it up here in any web browser is what you need in order to, to take this code. Cause what I'm going to do it, once it's in the web browser is I'm going to, I'm just I contextual menu here to look at the page source. Okay, you should be getting a clue here that source means I'm looking at the code. And I can copy this code, just go into a entry. I'm just going to, I'm just going to start with a clone, which has all my, all my information there. And now I'm going to go into source, I'm going to clear out anything that's in here. I could easily, again, have done it from scratch, pasting the code there. And there I go. And now actually now Ventry's system is showing me how this HTML email is structured. What you're seeing the gray lines are tables, HTML tables. And this is common in HTML email design. This is how we make everything work. Okay. Now, if I wanted, to, if I wanted this just as a sort of a starting point for my own designs, this is all I need. If I want to make a copy of the whole email, so it's here, including images, I have to do one more step. I have to go back to the email here in the web browser. And what I would do again, I'm going to right click on the image. I'm going to save the image to my computer and then upload it to a Ventry and then replace that image in a Ventry with with this, so in case whoever created this original email deletes this image off their servers, because right now the code is still pointing 
graphic images and links to their servers. Again, I'm just sort of uh, borrowing the design from them. But if I would like to have a copy so I can see everything, including images, I'm going to save the image. And then I'm just going to replace theirs with the same version uploaded to Eventry. OK. Right now, I did this in the registration module. Like I'm saying, you could do this in the marketing module, any place where you can create emails. OK. Now, as I said, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of HTML email design. But let me, if you're interested, let me point you in a couple of resources. Um, email on Acid is an online service that actually we use, and it's for testing emails. When you when you're okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about email design. Um, we designers have to make a web um, a uh, an email that can be viewed on multiple different platforms, different computers, computers versus desktop versus mobile, different email programs. Um, and it's really nice to be able to test those emails on different platforms. Now, there are, I don't know how many, less than 100, but a lot of different combinations of software and software versions and platforms to test against. So there are two services that I know of that can test against multiple combinations of platforms and programs. And one of them is email and asset. That's what we use when we create emails for our templates. The other one is litmus. Now, again, these offer services for email testing, but they also have help documents. So if you want to learn more about HTML email design, you could go to either of these websites and look at their support docs, and they're open to the public. You don't have to have an account to access uh, and read up on this. You can also check any email campaign services. I know MailChimp has some great ones. Constant Contact, I assume Salesforce has some somewhere. So if you, again, want to study this, you can. And I believe, I kind of added this at the last minute, I believe the Marketing Hub has some web, or not some web, some webinars or some uh, have offered classes in email design as well. And if nothing else, they're a good resource for asking questions because they, they designed the uh, templates in Salesforce Marketing Cloud. Um, so I just want to provide those as, if, if you're more interested in HTML design, there you go. Um, that's all I have for you today, we're getting done a little fast, a little early. So let's head into the snappy answers to your questions. And uh, while I'm taking your questions, let me also just throw up that prize giveaway I talked about at the beginning. So here's the information. But please uh, let me know. I'll either unmute your microphones or post in the chat questions about anything that I've talked about today or anything event related and uh, happy to help you out. Someone has a question about PayPal, well, go ahead. You can either unmute your microphone if it's easier or, or just put it in the chat. Okay. Or can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask you verbally because um, I'm not quite sure how to write all this down. Yeah. So I am told that right now for our registration system, we only can only take PayPal. Is that correct? Or is there, or is there an option? For somebody to use a credit card, or is there is there something that are that we are doing incorrect that is not allowing that is not allowing registrants to pay um, outside of PayPal? Well, I don't, yeah, I don't know who gave you that information, but actually, no, we can't ac we cannot accept credit card payments in Aventry with PayPal at all. We use what's called QuickPay. 
Quick pay. And okay. this is set up through ASU. First of all, you have to get a quick pay account and you do that through uh, ASU Merchant Services. We have a, a uh, ServiceNow catalog form that you fill out if, if your unit already doesn't have one. And the quick pay account is connected to a workday account. And so anytime someone registers for your event, they're paying a fee, they will be transferred from your eventry website to the quick pay portal for providing their credit card information and bill information, paying that fee. And then after they've submitted payment, they will be returned to the eventry registration site to say, okay, your registration is complete. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, so it's probably a different portal then. Okay, but um, there was some confusion whether it was a ventry or if it was a different system. Um, I, I haven't received complete clarification, but I just figured I'd ask since I'm already here. Well, I would be curious because mm -hmm. as far as I know, a ventry is the only authorized event registration service that uh, ASU Merchants allows you to use for accepting fees. Um, I, and anytime I've brought up PayPal with them, they, they get stern with me. They, that's not, that's not a system they want you to use. Good to know. I will get to the bottom of this. Well, thank you for you know, that information. Feel, feel, yeah. You know, feel <laughs> free to reach out with other questions or, you know, off, offline. Um, Perfect. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, let me also couch that unless you've gone to with an outside events services company that has their own event registration site, that might be a whole other kettle of fish. But as far as registration sites here at ASU, that's, that's what I know. I could be wrong, but that's what. <laughs> it doesn't hurt to ask. So that thank, never hurts to thank, ask. thank you for that information. Mm -hmm. I will. I will follow up with our office then. Thank you so much. This actually is very, very helpful. Hi, Rebecca. Uh, is there any way to request that an entire registration site auto open on a certain set date time and or setting the agenda sessions within the registration to auto close on a certain date time. Hi, Steve. Um, so just, just in an overall registration, I know this wasn't um, possible earlier. I don't know if anything's been added, but I haven't been able to find anything. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, if, if an event organizer wants the registration open, you know, on Saturday morning at 8 a.m., <laughs> you know, right. and right. I, you know, do I always have to go in there and, and auto open it? Or I mean, not auto, sorry, manually open it you know, at a certain date time or just say, you know, it's only Monday through Friday, this, you know, these hours that I can open that. Uh, the only thing I got for you there, so I, I don't know of any way to set the entire registration site to auto open. It's an interesting feature and I'm happy to provide that to Aventry as a feature request. Uh, what you do have available right now is through categories, you can set when a category is available. Yes, I have that's seen the, that feature. That's the closest mm -hmm. you're going to get. Let's see, where is it? Uh, this category is available only on certain dates. So you can yes. set a starting date. Uh, and I don't know if you're, you know, you could, if you're using a single category, you, that's easy, right? You right. Put a, I would put a little helper text uh, on the registration because once you, make the site go live, uh, anyone can go to that URL early, but this is a way of saying, uh-uh, you can't register until until this, this date and time on our eventry server, wherever that is. Okay, so even if there weren't categories, that might be a way to get around it. Okay. Well, you need, you need one, you need a category because this is, it's a category feature. Right. Um, is what I'm saying. So, I mean, and. Yeah, so that that's the category was just registrant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. you know, they don't have to when you have a single category, and this is why we have general admission, people don't have to see the category. I forget do right. I have right. Let's see, do I have it available? Yeah, see, I've got it hidden uh in my so they don't they they they're getting into a category 
but they don't see that they're in a category. Um, and one of the reasons I, I, you should always include one category is really if you're ever going to need to change the registration later and need that category feature, right? Mm -hmm. The first group, oh, they're already in that category. Great. Now I'm going to make a staff category. Oh, and I see uh, Jacob registered as an attendee. I'm going to move him into staff. You can change things around and change visibility. So I would always, I would, I always recommend having one category that people okay. are in automatically uh, easier if you need to adjust later. And then the so, second part is there um, with my yeah, agenda I don't, sessions. Don't know. About I have that. a lot of things so like summer programs that run over the summer, and mm. you know, there's like week one, week two, and you know, they want those certain registrations, short of like you know, creating all separate links. Yeah, I, I was wondering if there's just any way to. I'll go in and hide it when they want it, you know, registration to close. But again, that's a manual process. I have to set little oh, calendar yeah. reminders and everything. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a definite no of uh, having that available now, but I'm again, happy to, to supply these to uh, Aventry. We meet with Aventry uh, account admin on their side once a month. And this is what I do. Thank uh, you. Ask, they, they tell me what's coming down the pipeline and they're, development process and I tell them what our users are asking for features. So. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, another question. And when cloning an old event tree to make a new event under event emails beta in section system emails to administrators, can we delete unused emails or does that cause problems? There are a lot of unused emails in both. You are absolutely you, you absolutely you can you can delete any emails that have come over in the clone. Um, I have heard some reports that some people were having issues with that after a clone in the new e email beta. Uh, they could not. They could not delete old emails. If you know, you should be able to. If you can't, send that to support eventually support, and say, here's my. You know, give them the event name. Give them the event number and say, please delete this email, this email, this email in the scheduled email section or wherever it is uh, for me because I can't. And not only will they take care of it, but they will report that to the uh, development team because again, we're, we're in a beta, okay? There are, are gonna be some issues like that. But typically when you clone anything in Aventry, it should clear out any data and allow you to delete things you don't want. So that's the way it should work. That's the way one day it will work if it's not now. So long answer, but yes, Carl. Uh, where can we find the ASU colors in the text editor when editing text, emails, et cetera? Or do we need to upload them in a theme somewhere? Well, if you're in an HTML field, it should be easy. If you are highlighting text up here, you've got two buttons. One changes the color of the text and another changes the background color. To do ASU colors, you need to click and you need to click the more colors feature. And if you happen to know, what the ASU hexadecimal, there's a, there's a word, hexadecimal color is. Hexadecimal is how we can tell websites what a color is, or one of many ways. Um, then you enter it there. You see it's already selected. I hit OK. And now my text is ASU colors. Unfortunately, that used to work that it would, the system would remember that up here. Well, I guess it does now. Yeah, so now I can, now can I use it somewhere else? This is live and unscripted, folks. Yes, cool. Can I use it over here? No. So it's remembering from my text color. It hasn't remembered from my background color, but again, I can do the same thing. And uh, when you write hexadecimal, you do have to include that pound sign, six to seven, 
and I, I don't remember this, folks. I've got a post-it note on my desk for this. If you do not know what the ASU brand colors are, you can go to brandguide.asu.edu, and it will give you everything you've ever wanted to know about the colors of ASU, what type of, what the ink called, what the, uh, what the uh, coding is for it and websites. Uh, so there, that is how you do that. And uh, does it remember? Excellent, so it remembers. Now, if I think if I leave this email, it won't remember in the next one. Like I say, live and unscripted. Let's go to... Yeah, so it's just gonna remember it uh, in the email you are in. Okay. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca has just posted the uh, link in the chat to the brand guides page on, on color. A, a riveting read, the whole brand guide. Hey, Stephen. For those of you um, who uh, don't know, that was sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to say, what, first, thank you so much for this session. Uh, this is probably one of actually my favorite user group meetings. I learned so much great information, and thank you for answering all the amazing questions. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was just kind of asked, wondering about the the text, just because, like, like you saw, like it kind of doesn't save. It kind of saves it in the moment, but it doesn't save it to like other emails and stuff like that. And since, like, sometimes I'm just trying to like you know pump out a ton of different type of emails, um, and it'd be nice to obviously not like punch in the codes every single time just to make it, you know, nice all ASU brain standards. Um, I don't know if that's something that you can bring up to the um, account admins um, at Eventry to be like, hey, if, are we able to add like um, the ASU branded colors into that just so we can make sure that it's just a little bit easier on us and then also make sure that we're staying within the uh, brand colors, which would be really awesome. Sure. So I wasn't sure if that was something else. I mean, I'm, um, I'm always happy to ask. <laughs> yeah. And then one other kind of off-related thing that I think, I think, I know that it doesn't happen. And I know um, Eventry has told me this, this doesn't happen right now, but it'd be really nice is if once your event has filled up and you have a wait list and then people come off the wait list or um, then uh, people say, oh, you know, I can't attend anymore. So you cancel them. And then you go to send them, send the wait list people, hey, register for an email. What ends up happening is because now Eventry sees, oh, wow, like you had a hundred people. Now you have like 95. Now we can open it up. So basically it opens it up technically to the public, but there's like 15 people on the wait list. I was wondering if there was a way that it sees like, oh, you have five spots open, but you have 15 people on the wait list. We're going to close this to the public. So it's still going to say that it's um, that it's closed and they have to get on the wait list in order to, you know, hope in, in coming to the event um, and give priority to those that are on the wait list rather than if just some random people just see like, oh, cool, like it's open back up again, I can go register. But there's all these people on the wait list um, that like, sure. they kind of stepped in front of them. Right. Um, I, I talked at least a while ago, eventually like still didn't have a um, they didn't have a work around this. It just was kind of like, oh, well, hopefully no one does that. But I wasn't sure if that's something else you could bring up to the account admin just to kind of, I mean, right. it probably would be a lot, um, well, but it's just a way to like. Let, let's that. clarify a couple of things. First of all, there are two different kinds of waitlisting in the system. There's event level and category level waitlisting and there's session level. Now, event level and category waitlisting actually does allow you to set up what's called automatic processing mm -hmm. so that if someone was to go into registration and cancel, and this is at the event level, or I could say for a specific category, you've limited how many people can go into a category, whatever that is. Uh, once someone cancels, then the system will look at the list of who's on the wait list and send them that email right away. Now, once they get the email, you you know if you've enabled waitlisting, we haven't go ahead a demo on waitlisting in the user group. You set up waitlisting. You set up how long that person has until they can you know to to register because you don't want to give it a, an unlimited amount of time to come back. Well, most people don't. They want to fill up the event. Um, and I believe that if you have this set to automatic, it's going to hold that seat until the waitlisted person who has been sent an email signs up for however long you've said, okay, 24 hours or a day or a week. Um, so there's that system. Again, that's event level 
and category level. S the session level wait list is a whole other beast. And I actually just call that a fill, put butts in seat feature, okay? It does not have a way to automatically notify uh, the next person in line, next person on the wait list that that session is available. Uh, that is a manual process. And we have moved, we have asked that before. I think it's a heavy lift programming wise. Um, because every event has a uh, has a, an event and likely a category, so that's easy to set waitlisting programming. But not every event has sessions, and so programming for that contingency is a little trickier. I you know I I, I I've heard it, and I, I'm happy to bring it up again with support to let them know that you know we've got people who want this feature. Um, does that help? Yeah, I mean, I was just really talking on like the event level side of things. And at least, I mean, I asked a little while ago, so I wasn't sure if it was recently updated, um, if the waitlisting feature had, you know, taken into account um, that there are people been on the waitlist and, you know, not allowing other um, like non waitlist people to register. Um, I, but I haven't um, checked on that in a little while. And as we were getting back to a lot more things, I just wanted to make sure. Hmm. Um, but thank you so much for um, yeah. clarifying that. Yeah, happy. Happy to help. Uh, Jasmine's asking on the clone, how do you change the top header color or text color of sessions when they print out on the registration confirmation email? Let me change the top when they print out on the registration email. Oh, so if I'm following this, Jasmine, uh, I think you're referring to when you use the merge code for telling people when uh, what sessions they've signed up for, and yes. the, the merge code provide. Yeah, no, there, mm, there yes, so um, the merge there, you use the merge code in the email that is sent for confirmation, yeah. but then when it um, shows up, the header. Uh, so the header is maroon and the session name is uh, black. And so it's really hard to read. So I was wondering if you could either change the header, which sounds more complicated, or at least change the font so that you could see it better. Yeah, it's, I mean, I know it can be done, but it's been a long time since I've looked at it and the, my memory's not jumping up at the answer. So let me look into that. And uh, let me see if it's something like we can fix in a template um, uh, for future versions of the template, but then also provide the answer on how to fix it for running events. If you could, uh, if you could send me an, a, an example, uh, email or DM me in Slack, an event and an event number where you saw this happening, that way I can also see if you're using an older event, because it's possible I have fixed this in a more recent template. Okay, sure, um, I will do I that. Can, I can I can see, uh, that might be my easy answer if that's the case. I just said, hey, just get our new template. <laughs> and actually that might be HTML code. Then quite likely that that's the case, uh, it being HTML code, because that's, that's what describes anything in the email as far as look and feel in an email is HTML code. So I know there's a way to do it. And like say, maybe it's already been done. My fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, give me an example of where you saw it and I'll look into it and get back to you. And report, okay. I'll pack up for the good of the order. I'll, I'll post the answer in Slack for everybody. Thank you. All right, well, we're coming up to the end of the hour. Any last questions? Let me uh, toss up that prize giveaway slide while we're talking again. And remember that all these items are going to become collector's items when Aventry gets their new name. I still have not heard what the, what that is or when it's going to happen. But uh, here is your chance. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah I've, guessed, I've got some e-touches stuff hanging around still. For those of you who are new to Aventry, this will be our second name change over five years. It's the company was eTouches when we when we first uh, signed up with them. 
I think they became a venture within the first year. So. Okay, well, uh, as always, folks, if you uh, have questions or just too shy to ask, feel free to reach out to uh, Laura or myself or post it on the Slack channel and the uh, collective uh, mind dive will uh, come up with an answer. And I'm starting to see other users answering other people's questions. And I think that's terrific. Uh, really warms the cockles of my heart. But if you'd like to talk to us, you can send an email to adventure.asu.edu. Don't forget, we've got a lot of how-tos, videos, and articles on our support page, adventure.asu.edu, uh, or give us a call. So with that, I'm going to end uh, the session, and uh, everybody have a good rest of your day. Oh, and I will send out an email when this video is available for viewing. So see you all next month.